We are up to week three of uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I hope you've been uh, enjoying it, or at least you've been um, engaged by it. I have, obviously, since I, I have to prepare the sermons, uh, and I've enjoyed doing so. And uh, I've had a lot of things that I've been reflecting on. But uh, today we're up to week three of our series. There's today, next week, our brother Shui will preach uh, a sermon, and then the last week, week five, and we'll wrap that up. But uh, last week we looked at Ecclesiastes 2, uh, as Justin was uh, talking about it at the top of the uh, service, and we looked at what happens when uh, people, you and I, we try to find fulfillment, meaning in uh, chasing pleasure, wisdom, or work, and we saw how this the teacher in Ecclesiastes, the writer, how he went on this experiment where he wanted to find out if you could find meaning and fulfillment in those things. And he chased after pleasure, wisdom, and work. And uh, we, we learned what happened. And uh, during the week, our life group, the life group uh, I belong to on Tuesdays, we did a little bit of artwork. We, we copied the idea from the other group from the week before. And um, We've got a couple of uh, masterpieces that we put together. Um, and this was uh, chapter two, uh, the first half on what happens uh, when you try and chase pleasure with planting trees, fruit trees, and drinking and uh, having people who sing to you and having property. Um, so this was uh, one of our efforts. There's another one as well. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, our group broke off into two breakout rooms. This was my breakout room, and this was the guy's breakout room, and you can tell <laughs> that it's us. And uh, so, yeah, so this was um, our attempt to portray the first half of Chapter 2, uh, chasing after the wing, trying to find meaning in uh, wealth and cars, possessions, uh, drinking. So that was the first half of Chapter 2. Uh, and then the second half, uh, what happens when people try and find meaning and fulfillment by chasing after knowledge and uh, academic achievements or uh, by working, working hard and how uh, that too, as the teacher says, is uh, meaningless, a chasing after the wind, nothing gained under the sun. That was the conclusion of the teacher at the end of chapter two that everything was a vapor, a mist, it was meaningless, a chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So that was the conclusion at the end of chapter two. Uh, and it's important for us to keep this context in mind uh, so we don't read into today's verses in chapter three, meaning that it's not in those verses, uh, which often people do. So let's... Uh, Keep that in context, and let's uh, let's jump into chapter three, verses one to fifteen. Chapter three of Ecclesiastes, one to fifteen. I'll read them out. You can follow on the screen or on your phones. Chapter three, verse one. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink 
and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is has already been, and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. This is a fairly well-known passage, especially verses 1 to 8, right? The first uh, eight verses. Most of us have heard uh, this passage, the first few verses especially. And most of the time when people read those verses, they assume that the right of Ecclesiastes is giving you ethical teaching. He's giving you ethical advice. He's saying, here's the things you should be doing in your life. Here are the shoulds and the oughts to. There are times when you should be crying and there are times when you should be laughing. There are times when you should be tearing down and times when you should be building up. There are times when you should be silent. There are times when you should speak up. There are times for all of these different things and you're supposed to do them all. The problem with that is that Ecclesiastic is not an ethical book. It's not a book about ethics. It's not even a book about religious beliefs. The writer of Ecclesiastes, the teacher, is only interested in pointing out reality. He points things out in the most blunt, in your face, I just tell it as it is, way. And then he makes almost no judgment about it. So here in chapter three, verses one to eight, uh, the teacher is not even saying whether something is good or bad. He's just saying, look, sometimes in life you're going to cry. Is that good or bad? I don't know. It's going to happen. Sometimes you're going to laugh. Is that good or bad? Whatever. I don't know. He says, it's going to happen. That's all I know. These things will happen. And then those other things are going to happen. And there's no judgment on them. They just are. That's just reality. That's just life under the sun, or as he calls it in verse one, life under the heavens. And so this first eight verses, this whole, this poem is a poem of couplets. They're called couplets. A couplet simply refers to two lines appearing in a poem, one after the other, side by side, contrasting two different things. And so if you want to understand these first eight verses, uh, the very first pair, the first couplet, the first two things that are named are the key to unlocking everything else. The first couplet is the container of all the other pairs of things that are named. So, um, and here's the first couplet, verse two. There's a time to be born and a time to die. So a time to be born and a time for dying. That's the box, the container in which everything else fits. It's between those two things, your birth and your death, that everything that follows will happen. It's a direct consequence of your birth that any of those things are even possible for you and for me. But not only are they possible, says the teacher, they're inevitable. Will we cry in life? Yes, of course. Will we laugh in life? For sure. It's going to happen. This is what happens between birth and death. See, according to the book of Ecclesiastes, there are two different realms, two kingdoms, right? The realm of the created and the realm of the uncreated. uncreated. And verses 1 to 8 here speak of the realm of those things that are created. Uh, as it says in verse 1, of life under the heavens. Uh, or if, as we heard before, life under the sun. As soon as you're born, you now enter this realm of life under the heavens. And once you're born and you enter this realm of life, there is one thing constant that happens throughout everything that's created. From the time you're born to the time that you die. There's one thing that never, ever changes. 
And there's one word that's this, used to describe that thing that never, ever changes. And the teacher used that word. Did you notice what word he kept on using? Time. Time, 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 time. Time for this, time for that, time for this, time for that. Time, you enter the realm of time when you enter the realm of the created. Time has a beginning and an end. It moves. It's got a past and a future. And the thing that never, ever changes in life under the heavens, the thing that is completely certain and constant in the realm of time is this one thing. The thing that never changes is that everything changes. Everything changes. That's the thing that never changes. This is what it means to live life in the realm of time. Are you going through a difficult time right now? A difficult, challenging time? Do you have lots of serious problems that you're facing? In the realm of time, just be patient. And all of your problems will eventually go away. They always do. You want to fix your problems? Just wait. Eventually, they'll go away. Sooner or later, they will go away. On the other hand, if you're having a wonderful time in your life, a great time, uh, things are going really well, you're full of happiness and laughter and everything's great, just wait. Just wait. Problems will find you. They always find us. They're coming our way. Sooner or later, guaranteed. It's just the nature of life under the heavens. So the writer here is saying that there's going to be times when you laugh and there's going to be times when you cry. That's what happens. You enter life under the heavens. You're guaranteed these things. You're going to have a bunch of problems. And you're going to have a bunch of good times. And they're going to be constantly trading places. And when you've had enough of a bunch of problems, at some point, eventually, they'll go away. And then there's a set of wonderful things that happens. And then there's a new set of problems that comes along. And you just keep going on in this cycle of time. A time for this, a time for that, a time for this, a time for that. And then, apparently, we die. We die. Death. Which is really the guarantee when all of your problems will disappear once and for all. And all of your good times will also end. This is the message of Ecclesiastes here. You are born. You have a whole bunch of problems. You also have a whole bunch of good times, and then you die. And not in that order. All the best. Enjoy your life. See, that's why many people are not so keen on the book of Ecclesiastes. This is not a feel-good book. It's kind of depressing. You look at this and you go, really? Wow. That did not help. And in case we missed it, the teacher emphasizes what he just said with verses 9 to 10. He ends those eight verses, time for this, time for that, and says, What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. It's pretty bleak, but fortunately, verse 11 comes along. And the teacher goes on to say something fairly positive in verse 11. After he's gone through all that stuff, and even though all of that is true, he now says that the times of our lives, all those times, the good and the bad, time for this, time for that, all of those times are under the powerful care of the God of time. So that's my second point. First point was the times of our lives. Verses 1 to 8, and now the God of time, verse 9 to 11, but specifically verse 11. Verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time, 
He's also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Just a quick observation, not to disappoint you or uh, upset you, but when he says he has made everything beautiful in its time, the word is probably much better translated, not so much beautiful, but he's made everything in life appointed at the right time. He's had everything in life be in its right place. So it's not so much about how beautiful something is, it's about how there's an order to the times. They come, they go, more times come, more times go, and things just keep happening. But we're going to focus on that second uh, half of the verse. Uh, God has set eternity in the human heart. What does that mean? Well, because God is an eternal God, he's done it and he's created us in his image. So the God of eternity, the God beyond time, who lives outside of time, the God who is at work from the beginning to the end, as it says in the verse, that eternal God creates time and creates humans made in his image and places eternity in their hearts. And so the God of eternity, the God of time, and he's the God of our times. Now, just to spend a couple of minutes on, on the word eternity, because it's an important word to unpack, because uh, the teacher uses this word in contrast to that word he's been using for time uh, that he's used through verses 1 to 8. Now, the original uh, Hebrew word uh, tra here translated eternity, uh, often people think it just means forever, something that goes on and on a long, long, long time. Uh, but there's a problem if you try and translate it like that because it's confusing two different things. The original word describes not time going on forever, but describes a realm or an experience that is independent of time. It's something that has no experience or connection to what happens in time. And just to make this practical and to bring it down to earth, uh, every one of you has had this experience of eternity in your life. Every one of us. Have you ever been uh, doing something you really, really enjoy? Or, or you were with a group of your best friends having a really wonderful, incredible time, and you completely lost track of time. Before you knew it, half a day had gone by, or a whole day, and it felt like it was no time at all because you were so caught up in the moment. You were so enjoying what you were doing, the people you were with. That time just seemed to collapse. Uh, when you experience that kind of joy, it changes your relationship to time. So it's like time's got an elastic quality to it. And when you're doing something you really, really enjoy, time collapses. It's like it disappears. But when you're doing something you really, really don't want to do, or you're with people you don't really want to be with, time just extends and drags, and it really seems like it's forever. So like when you're waiting for a medical exam result uh, to see what is that lump that you have in your body, what happens to time? it slows down, right? It goes really, really slowly. What happens when you're on your, your two-week honeymoon in Hawaii? What happens to time then? It collapses. It disappears. It's fast. It flies by. When we experience joy, blissful times and experiences, time it's like it disappears. In that moment, we enter the realm of eternity, a realm that has no relationship to time whatsoever, as if time doesn't even exist. This is what the writer of Ecclesiastes is getting at. He's saying that that realm of eternity, God has placed in every human heart, in every one of your hearts, a place that has no beginning, 
that has no end and that its experience is changeless, eternal, enduring joy and life and bliss and love. It's like the human heart has no, it's not subject to time at those times. Um, and we already know this. I mean, we all know it. Think about it for a minute. Your body and your mind today, it's in constant change. It's always been in constant change. The body you had as a child, that I had as a child, is not the same body you have today. Uh, and the body you'll have when you're 80 years of age is not the body you have now. The thoughts you had as a child are not the thoughts that you have today. Uh, and the thoughts uh, and capacities that you'll have when you're 80 are very different to your physical and mental capacities that you have now. See, everything about our lives in time is essentially an arc of building up and then a fairly slow, long, slow fade and deterioration. That's what happens in time. That's what life under the sun looks like. In time, everything changes and grows and then slowly deteriorates and dies. That's how it works, right? But the human heart is not bound or connected to that arc at all. Everything physical and mental in your life will deteriorate. But love, joy, peace, hope, these things don't have to deteriorate and fade away. A capacity to know and feel these things does not deteriorate. The heart does not know time. The heart is not subject to the rules of time. That's why when people get older, and I'm sure you've had these conversations, and people turn, say, 50 or 60 or 70, they rarely ever say, wow, yeah, I really, I really feel 60 now. I really feel like I'm 60. Maybe their bodies do. My body does. But most people I know, including myself, as they age, they will tell you they still feel like they're 25 uh, or like a teenager. Or they can access that childlike wonder and joy and sense of fun because the human heart doesn't know age. And if that's true, this should be a clue to us, an important clue that as we live in this world of time, everything that's constantly changing, good times come, good times go, uh, then bad times come and bad times go, and then you die. The right of Ecclesiastes wants to say all that stuff that's happening in time you don't have to be subject to it. You don't have to be oppressed by it because there's a part of you that God has made that he planted in you that is not affected by any of that. There's a part of every single one of us that has this gift of eternity, a place that is experienced as eternal, unchanging, unending, a shelter from the storms of life, a lamp in the darkness that never goes out. A place within you that's calm and still and you can know God's presence. And you can know who you really are in him. No matter what's happening around you in time. Okay, so if all that is true, how do we live in time having eternity in our hearts. If our lives are made up of all these different times lived in time, times which come and go, uh, some of which you'll enjoy, some of which you won't, different times which keep coming and going. If that's what makes up life under the sun, under the heavens, how do we live wisely in the times we've been given by the God of time, the God who's placed eternity in us? So verses 12 to 15 uh, help us with that. How to live at our times, how to live in time. First of all, verses 12 to 13, we live with thankfulness. We live with thankfulness. 
Verse 12, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. So, says the teacher, because the reality of life and the reality of good times and bad times that will come and go, live out your life enjoy it and be thankful by all means eat drink be happy do good things work hard and enjoy it all all those things are gifts from a generous god to be received gladly and to be enjoyed so friends enjoy your life that god's given to you enjoy it and be thankful Next time you have that amazing meal or holiday, enjoy and be thankful for your job, your career, your studies, and all the benefits they bring to you. Enjoy them, savor them, and give thanks to God for them. Because they're all gifts, gifts given to you, to me, by God, as we live at the times of our lives. Let me just give you a practical example or a tip that I think really helps us do this. Uh, and that's the, the practice or the habit of having a gratitude journal or a Thanksgiving uh, list. Um, no, something where you write down all the things you're grateful for to God and just to people and, and keep that with you and read it and, and use it every day. Just, just try it. Give it a go. I dare you. Try to, have, to keep a thanksgiving or gratitude journal or, or lists for about a month. Because I guarantee you, at the end of a solid month, you will be a more thankful person, a more joyful person. If you're not, I'll give you your money back. Okay? I promise. Give it a go. Many people, including myself, we have done this at times in our lives, or we still do it now, this spiritual discipline, this spiritual habit, and we can all testify to the incredible difference it can make and the blessing it is in making us more thankful, joyful people. And when you do things like this, that's how you nurture and develop the eternity God has placed in your heart. That's how you become more and more who you already are in God. So give that a go. Become a more thankful, joyful person. Uh, keep a gratitude or a Thanksgiving journal or, or lists. But secondly, verses 14 and 15, the other way to uh, live wisely your times is to remember that whatever time you're going through, this too will pass. Verses 14, 15. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever it has already been and what will be has been before. And God will call the past to account. So here we're brought back to the God of eternity. The one who's placed eternity in your heart. Because he is the only one who is unending, the eternal God, the one who placed eternity in you. And because he is eternal, everything he does is eternal too. And everything that comes from him, everything he does will endure forever, for eternity. So even though you and I live in this realm of time, of change, the realm of the created, the realm of heaven, where things are temporary, they pass, they change, they move on. Your good times, they will pass. Your bad times will also pass. That's just their nature. Anything in time, in the created realm, good or bad, will pass. So if you're going through some really difficult time right now, just remember, it will pass. And if you're going through some really great, wonderful time, enjoy it because it too will pass. But there's something that is not created. 
in the created realm that never passes. There's a place in your heart from the day you were born, the place where the God of eternity, the eternal God, the one who does things that endure forever, a place where he dwells in you, a place of love and joy and peace and hope. Everything else will pass, but he won't, and neither will the eternity he's placed in your heart. So in conclusion, as we said last week, at the end of the day, we can agree with the teacher of Ecclesiastes in his blunt and brutal observations about life, about reality. Um, and this, so there's no problem in saying, yes, you're right. Everything you've said is true and right. But for people who trust in Jesus, people like you and me, that's not everything there's to say. There is something more, as we said last week. If you know Jesus, there is something more to be said and done because God has said and done something more in and through his son. In Jesus, the eternal God steps into time, into human history. The God of time steps into the times of our lives. He experiences them. He shares in our times the good and the bad, all the different times of your life. And he redeems them. God takes on the times of our lives and redeems them and shows us how to live them wisely. So just as you go, remember how to live wisely the time God gives you. First of all, in light of everything we've said, trust God with your life. Trust him with your life. Trust him with all of your times, the good and the bad, um, because he's in control. You're not, but he is. You're not in control of the times which you're having and will have. Times will come, they will stay for a while, and then they'll leave. And then more times will come into your life, and then they will go. And you will not be able to prevent any of those times, whether good or bad, from coming to you or from leaving you, whether good times or bad, because we're not in control. We never have been and never will be. But the God of time is, and he is good, so you can trust him with your life. You can trust him with your times. So please stop trying to manage your life. Give that up. It's a losing game. Stop trying to manage your life. Stop trying to control your life or to hold on to it. Just let go. And as it says, let God. Let go of your attempts to manage your life, to control it. Trust him with your times and trust him with your life. And finally, remember, remember your faithful father. Uh, James 1.17 uh, encourages us to do just that. Every good and perfect gift, says James, is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So here's the final thing about living wisely, the times God gives you. Remember your Father, the God you trust, who's your Father the faithful giver of good gifts. Every good and perfect gift in your life, your family, your friends, love, laughter, holidays, things, people, work, it's a gift. Most of all, his son, Jesus, the greatest gift. And through him, every other spiritual gift, church, uh, your new spiritual family, the community, so remember, remember your father, the faithful giver of good gifts, and enjoy and rejoice in every gift that he gives you. And through it all, all the times of your life, which will come and which will go, remember to keep looking to your good father, the one who will always be there, the one who never changes, the one who will always love you guide you 
and provide you with everything you need for this life and beyond. Amen. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you are a faithful, generous, kind Father. We thank you that you love us, that you love us so much that you gave us your son, that you love us so much that you give us every good gift. Father, we thank you that you do not change. You are always loving, always faithful, always true, always gracious, and always there. Please help us to trust you with our lives, to trust you with our times, to trust you with everything we have and everything we do. Help us to give up our efforts to control our lives, to manage them, and help us to give them up to you, to let them go and to let you be at work in our lives and to trust you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.